Glory to God. Hallelujah. Something's got to break in this earth. Something's got to break in this earth realm. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe when there starts to be some shaking, it's going to start to be some breaking in the name of Jesus. Amen. I believe some strongholds are going to be broken in Jesus' name. Come on. I believe somebody in poverty, generational poverty. Oh, my God. That curse is going to be broken in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Something's got to break. You know, even when you put a lid on a pot and you begin to boil it at some point. Come on, that pot is going to overflow. That lid is going to pop off because there's going to be too much pressure on the inside. We're living in a world and in a time where there's too much pressure. Too much pressure in this earth. And people wondering why in the world the earth is reacting like the earth is reacting and why the earth is responding like the earth is responding. There's too much pressure. Too much pressure in the earth today. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God, something's got to break. Something's got to break. We're at that point. It is critical. Yes, sir, it is critical. We are at the boiling point. My God, my God, that something must break. Hallelujah. In this earth realm, where we're going to talk today about uh, something that's going to help us take a little bit of pressure off. Amen. Something that's going to help us take a little bit of pressure off. Because well, sometimes the pressure that we experience in life is self-induced. Come on. Sometimes our struggle didn't have to be. And I am here to just remind us today and to share with someone who may not have known today that there is a way. His name is Jesus. And he already finished the work. Amen. I believe on Calvary's hill, on the cross of Christ, something broke. Satan's hold over you broke. Satan's right to possess you broke at the cross. Amen. Glory to God. You know, God is the one who can break something that ain't no coming back from that. Amen. And ain't no coming back. And we just thank God on today. We give him glory for being in the house, for being able to praise the Lord and glorify God. We thank God for the word of God. We thank God for the people of God. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you would have your way. Oh, God, reduce me, Lord, to the point that you need to, oh, God, that you may increase in me. Holy Spirit, have your way. Speak unto your people on today, O oh God. Lord, I am but an instrument to be used by you. Father, I thank you that you will ordain the words that come from my mouth. I thank you, Lord, for blessing and anointing and giving me grace to preach this word. And I thank you, dear Lord God, that it is only by your hand and by your spirit that we are even able to mumble a word of truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are truth, that you are love. We pray for those who are listening and hearing on today. May they hear deeply the word of God. Lord, we love you and praise you. Bless each and every person who participates in this worship service today. Bless each and every person who listens to the recording. God, we thank you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Church, say amen. 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 And amen again. Glory to God. Today, we are going to be talking about cross examination. Come on, cross examination. And if we were not sitting in the church house right now, we might think that, oh, the speaker is speaking about the judicial process. The speaker is talking about the judicial system. And the speaker will talk a little bit about the judicial system in this message, but we're only going to talk about the judicial system as it relates to the system of salvation. Come on, y'all ready to do that? Yeah, yeah. The system of salvation, yeah, because yeah. we know that in the criminal justice system, that when we speak of cross examination, we are speaking of something that takes place in a courtroom, right? Yes. We're speaking of something that takes place 
during a trial. Come on. Anybody who's under the system of salvation know anything about trials? Do you know that trials comes to make us what? Strong. Glory to God. But when we are talking about cross-examination in the courtroom, amen, we are talking about an opportunity that the defense as well as the people or the state or the prosecution, whichever you may call them, has an opportunity to question a witness. Somebody say, I'm a witness for the Lord. Lord. Okay, keep that in your hat right there. And the purpose of this cross-examination is to interrogate a witness. Come on. Has anybody ever been on the witness stand? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's an unnerving thing. It really is. And you know what happens in the judicial system when you have a witness, especially one of those witnesses that's critical to the defense. The defense does everything to protect that witness before the time comes for that witness to testify. The defense also takes time, much time, to prep that witness so that that witness would be prepared to share what needs to be shared. So um, what is a witness? A witness is one who has um, seen something or heard something or knows something. A witness is someone who has detailed, accurate, firsthand information about a situation. Come on, do you hear yourself as a witness in here? Come on, we're talking about the judicial system, but we're talking about the system of salvation also. Come on, right? And so the witness has to be prepped, has to be prepared. The witness has to practice and rehearse. And the witness is told that when you are cross-examined, make your answer short and precise, and by all means, be truthful. Right. Somebody say, be truthful. be truthful. If I'm a witness, come on, keep All saying, right. if, I'm a witness, if I'm a witness, I gotta be truthful. Gotta be truthful. Come on. So in the judicial system, once that witness is prepped, that witness is given an opportunity to take the stand. And when that witness takes the stand, it is all no, no bars, okay? It is an opportunity for the opposing side to discredit the witness's testimony, to reduce the effectiveness of the evidence that has been presented during the trial. Come on, we're gonna go there, we're going there, we're going there. And it is the opposing side's opportunity to twist the words of the witness in order to make that witness seem not credible. So essentially what the opposing side gets is an opportunity through cross-examination to rip holes in the testimony of the witness to tear the story line by line by the witness. That's, by, that's why the witness has to be prepared. That's why the witnesses yeah. have to be trained and prepped so they yeah. won't fall for the trick of the enemy. Come on. Yeah. So they will not fall and so they won't break under the pressure of the cross-examination. Yeah. Amen? Because the cross-examination is coming. Right? There's no doubt about it. Now, in most trials, the defense attorney will do everything to discourage the defendant from testifying. Now, why is that? It's because they do not want the opposing side to get an opportunity to discredit the witness. But how many of you know that sometimes, I don't care if you practice law, if you study law, if you teach law, or if you like me, you just occasionally watch Perry Mason, Law and Order, you know, whatever your knowledge is. You know that sometimes you cannot get around that one who has been accused having to testify. Come on, come on. Come on. Sometimes it just has to happen. Yeah. And so it takes that much more preparation, that much more control when you're on the stand and that cross-examination is coming and that opposing side is coming at you with all kinds of discrediting questions and innuendos. In in your windows and uh, suggestions, you know, it comes at you and it's rapid fire. It's like the darts of the enemy, right? Coming at you. So the witness has to be so 
prepared, glory to God, to stand under that pressure of the cross examination because the character of that witness is going to come up. Do you know that? Yes, How many of you know that many times the opposing side will not only try to discredit the story of the witness, but they will try to tear down the character of the witness. They may ask something like, have you ever been co uh, convicted of a felony? Have you ever broken the law? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. They might ask questions like that. Well, if that witness has been prepped properly and that witness has indeed and in fact been acute, not only accused, but convicted of a felony or a crime, that witness is going to say yes and stop right there. Yes and stop right there. Words are very few. You know, we can learn something from the judicial system, whether it be in study or in viewing entertainment, that our words sometimes just need to be few. I'm reminded of Jesus. I'm reminded of Jesus when he was cross-examined in the desert after his 40-day fast. And the accuser, the opposer, the one who came to prosecute him, to antagonize him came with all kinds of cross-examination trying to get him to act out of character and Jesus said it is written. Right. Jesus' words were few. He did not go into a dissertation with the devil. Amen? Eve messed up in the garden back in Genesis 3 when she had too many words for the devil. She should have stopped him right at the beginning. But see, the man Adam had not prepped his witness he hadn't prepared her enough to know that when the accuser comes to you trying to break the story down, trying to bring doubt, he didn't grab her. So she didn't know. So the devil cleverly came to her and said, did not God say? And as soon as he said that, she should have shut him down, but she didn't. And we know that by the sin of one man, we all were made sinners, right? right? But we're here today to talk about the system of salvation because there is one who ah, was made in the image of man, but he was fully God. And we know that when he hung on that cross, glory to God, yes, yes, yes. we know that he broke some things yes. and we know that he put some things into motion. And we're going to talk about the examination process. And I believe that during this message, we are going to uh, rediscover some people may discover, but most of us will rediscover some things about the cross that maybe we had forgotten, maybe we had set aside, maybe we just did not know. Amen? Amen. But I'm here to tell you that the cross is how we make it over. Yeah. Oh. The cross is how we make it over. You know, there used to be the old song, I don't know, you know, how I made it over. Well, we know how we make it over. Yeah. We make it over by the cross. Our cross is how we make it over. And we thank God that Jesus went and he was our advocate. See, it's a big thing in the judicial system for someone who is accused to have an alibi. Well, I might not have an alibi, but I got an advocate. And as long as I got an advocate, my advocate is gonna speak for me, whereas my whereabouts can't speak for me because it's just might happen that I was in the place where the crime was committed. I was in the place where the sin went down. It just so might happen that I am guilty. But you know what? In the judicial system, in theory, those who have been accused of a crime are considered to be innocent until what? Proven guilty. I said in theory. Innocent until proven guilty. But glory be to God, under that salvation system, everybody's guilty. But because of the blood of Jesus, we all get to walk out the courtroom free. Come on. We all get that not guilty on our record. Amen. And it's not because we did it or didn't do it, but it's because he did it. He finished it on the cross. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. There's a scripture in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. I'm going to read this from the English Standard Version. So it may read a little differently, but whatever translation you have is powerful. The word of God says in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, 
for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Come on, how magnificent is that? Mm -hmm. For in him, him being Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased. Not only dwelled in him, was pleased to dwell in him. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven, everything on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Somebody say on the cross. So you see this magnificent and powerful scripture tells us that the pleasure of almighty God was to dwell in the fullness, the fullest capacity, nothing missing, nothing broken to the point where no, it can contain no more, but nothing's gonna seep out. Come on, the fullness of God was in Jesus Christ when he hung on the cross, when he hung on the cross. And it says that he made peace, God through Jesus made peace with everything in heaven and everything on earth. So what does this tell us? This tells us that even in heaven, there was something that was not at peace with God before Jesus did what he did. Before Jesus went to the cross, even in heaven, there was something missing or something broken. Come on. That's what shalom peace means. Nothing missing, nothing broken, but a perfect peace. So how about there was something that was just not complete with the peace in heaven before God sent Jesus to die on the cross. But because he did, God has made peace with everything. And you know, it doesn't matter whether everything on earth makes peace with everything else. Come on, because we don't call the shots. Russia may never make peace with Ukraine. China may never make peace with the U.S., but there has been a reckoning. There has been a breaking. There has been something that has uh, um, withstood the test of time. Glory to God. There has been something that has shifted the need for mankind to live in peace. Glory to God. He went to the cross (laughs) and he did that thing. Somebody said he did it. Oh, he did it. Examination in the Greek and in Jews, it is only used in the New Testament in the in the book of Acts. When we are talking about Paul and reading about Paul, when Paul goes before um, the Roman governor and they have um, accused Paul of of such things that um, really boil down to the point that Paul was preaching the gospel. Amen. That he was preaching the gospel. He was uplifting Jesus as Christ the son of God and the king of Israel. And Paul was um, taken hold of, Paul was arrested and Paul was was bound and Paul was taken into a court, a judicial system. And so we find the word examine and examination in the book of Acts. And this word means a judicial investigation. Come on, this is back in the Bible, y'all. This ain't, you know, law and order. This is in the Bible. So Paul had to go undergo a judicial investigation because there were charges that had been brought against him. But in that judicial investigation, there came a time when the new governor, Festus, he said to the council, now y'all got to give me something better than this. What did this man do? They were not able to give him any evidence of what they were accusing Paul of doing. Actually, they couldn't even get their accusations together. And they wanted him to go before Caesar. And Festus said, no, not so. You got to give me something. What am I supposed to write on this order? All right. So he underwent this judicial investigation. The Webster's definition of examination is an extensive, detailed inspection. Come on. We're still talking about the cross. Come on. It is an extensive, detailed inspection. So why don't we, in detail, inspect the cross of Christ? This is the old rugged cross. 
is it not? So on this old rugged cross, we know that the Romans had designed this process of torture. And the cross was the focal point of that torture. Without the cross, the crucifix, the process would not have been the same. So in order to create these cross, make these cross, they had to get wood, right? And where does wood come from? Wood comes from trees. So when we're expecting this cross, we're gonna see everything and talk about everything that made up this cross, this cross that Jesus himself carried. Amen. Amen. Those who had been convicted of, uh, uh, of criminal acts had to carry their own cross. And so he carried this wood, this, this, this rugged wood on his back, on his shoulders after being tortured and beaten and spit upon, beard plucked out, thorns pushed down in his head to the point where they went through his skull. Come on, then he had to carry his cross. But before he did that, he had to go through a trial. He had to go through a trial. And in that trial, at one point, it looked like he may have been exonerated because Pontius Pilate gave the crowd an opportunity to choose to release Jesus who had not broken the law and did not know any sin or release Barabbas. So it looked for a second like Jesus might be set free. But how many of you know that if he had been, we would not have been? If he had been, we would not have been. So thank God that the crowd chose who they chose, glory to God. But this cross, this old rugged cross and you know, and I'm not, I don't know where the, where the wood came from in the territory. Glory to God. I don't know what type of tree it actually was. I'm sure there is some research that can be done that will tell us that. But what I do know that whatever type of tree, whatever type of, 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 of wood it was, I do know that it was created on the third day of creation when Jesus back in Genesis made that thing that he was now carrying. That's right. Come on. When he said, let there be earth. Let there be dry ground. Yeah, yeah, and it, the, yeah. the Bible says when the dry ground was made, that then he said, now let everything come up out of the ground that needs to come up out of the ground. Yeah. That meant plants and trees, glory to God, bushes. So we know that he called that very thing into existence. And if we believe that he is an omniscient God, if we believe that he is all-knowing, if we believe that he is Alpha and the Omega, if we believe that he was in the beginning before the beginning even began, if we believe that he had to know specifically which tree his son was going to carry on that day. I believe he mandated to that very wood to hold the son of God up, that it would not split and allow him to hit the ground before his job was finished. Glory to God. I believe that the creator and the maker of everything knew exactly when and where before the foundation of time that this would take place. Glory to God. See, sometimes the world thinks and in the judicial system, they think that they're pulling something over on the other side. Sometimes the enemy thinks he's pulling something over on you. Uh -huh. But as long as you are in the one who knows the beginning before the beginning, yeah. as long as you are in the one who knows what tree is going to be on his son's back, yeah. walking up to Calvary's hill, glory to God, if you are in him, then you are not guilty. You are not guilty. So we thank God that as we discover and rediscover and uncover things about this old rugged cross that we can take to heart, that we can personally grasp the message of the cross, the message of the cross. And we think back to the judicial system and know that the judicial system did not get to come to be just because of Americans. We see all through the Bible that there has been a judicial system there has been a process 
for dealing with people who are accused, a process for dealing with people who have committed crimes, glory to God. It's a process. That process has continued. Now, the process has gotten a little off. Not a little. It has gotten way off yeah. in America. It has yeah. gotten to the point where many Americans cannot trust the process. Come on. But even if you cannot trust the process of the judicial system, you must trust the process of the salvation system because there are so many who are in the judicial system who are experiencing grace and favor because of the salvation system. There are many who were in the judicial system who are now walking and operating in the salvation system to the point where what happened back in the judicial system no longer has any bearing on their life. Come on. God is ready to bring us out. He is ready to show us some things about the cross. He is ready to present his evidence. Come on. We know that in a criminal trial, evidence is king. Isn't it? Evidence is king. Evidence is the thing that really is going to shape in the minds of a judge or jury whether this thing went down the way that they're saying, whether this defendant is guilty or whether this defendant is, is innocent. If the evidence is weak, the case is weak. Come on. But I thank God that there is nothing weak about the evidence of the cross. I thank God that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he left all kinds of evidence. You know, in, in the judicial system, during the intense, detailed investigation, the investigators go in and they process the scene. They process the crime scene. And they find gold if they find blood spatter. If they find blood spatter, if they find fingerprints or handprints, if they find uh, 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 hair samples, if they find DNA of any kind. Come on. So we need to know that when the accuser of the brethren tries to cross-examine us about our salvation. Yeah. When the opposer comes in our life and whispers in our ear and tries to cross-examine us and break us down and make us doubt that we're even saved and make oh, us yeah. doubt the yeah. love of God and yeah. make us doubt whether God has called us not guilty or not. When he comes, we need to point him to the crime scene yeah. and say, go back to the hill. Yeah. Because every piece of DNA you find is going to trace back to Calvary's heel, to Calvary's heel. And the thing about it is, glory to God, when you get back to the scene, you're not gonna find April's fingerprints, but you're gonna find the fingerprints of the Almighty. You're gonna find the DNA of the divine one, glory to God. You're gonna find that one, glory to God, who stood in my stead, that one who hung on my cross, glory to God. We thank God that the scene is was bloody. It was bloody. Somebody said it was bloody. It was bloody. Just, for me. Just for me. Hallelujah. Yes. Give him a hand clap of praise if you thank God for that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. We thank God because we, as we look at this cross, I thought about it and I said, Lord, I'm thinking about what was at the cross and what was on the cross. And I said, since we're investigating, let's think about that a little bit. So at the cross, we had those who feared God, but those who mocked God. At the cross, we had the righteous, but we also had the unrighteous. At the cross, we had the wailers, but we also had the scorners. At the cross, we had friends, but we also had enemies. And when I say we, I mean Jesus, because when he hung up there, he was hanging up for we, right? Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. So at the cross, there were also loved ones, but there were haters as well. At the cross, there were sad and heartbroken people, but at the cross, there were also people who were happy and satisfied. Oh. Glory to God. At the cross, there were devoted followers, but there were also some very curious spectators at the cross. Yeah. But that's who was at the cross. And let's see what was on the cross. So on the cross, we had the very embodiment of love and sacrifice. Come on, did we not? Yeah. The very embodiment of love and sacrifice on the cross was God turned man, man turned over to God. Let me say that again. On the cross was God turned man, 
but man turned back over to God. At the cross, on the cross, on the cross, there was deity. On the cross, there was heaven's creator and earth's architect. Come on, come on. On the cross was salvation. On the cross was redemption. What was on the cross became a reflection of what was at the cross. So everything I just said that was on the cross intentionally made himself to be what was at the cross before he left the cross. And with that, I want to share a scripture with you. The scripture from 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. Oh, my God, my God. He did some stuff for us, y'all. He did some good stuff for us. We cannot forget the cross. Come on, we can't forget the cross. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. When we have, when you see someone with a cross around their neck, you need to think about, think about the message of the cross. Glory to God. No, we don't need to downplay it like uh, there was no suffering. Yes, there was suffering. There was shame. Glory to God. But it was for our own, our behalf. For our sakes and our souls, glory to God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, he, God, made Christ, who knew no sin, to judicially, come on, there's that word again. It's been in the earth, since the earth. Come on. So God made Christ, who knew no sin, to judicially become sin on our behalf. So that in him, we would become the righteousness of God. That means that we would be made, (laughs) somebody, please be happy about that. That we would be made acceptable to him and placed in right relationship with him by his gracious, loving kindness. Let me reiterate some things in here. God made Jesus. Who did no sin? He knew no sin. The Bible says he knew no sin. That means that he committed no sin whatsoever. Not even in his heart, Pastor. He didn't even sin in his heart, much less in word or deed. He knew that word knew means to have a means to means um uh has its foundational meaning like intercourse, to be intimately knowledgeable about sin. Jesus hadn't been intimate with sin at all. Not even in his heart. That means that this Jesus had never missed the mark of God. Never missed the mark of God. Yet, God made him miss the mark. On every level that mankind would ever miss the mark. God made him. And he did that judicially because he's the righteous judge. So he could call that shot. He could make that call. Glory to God. It did not involve a jury because nobody can show him or help him in being God. He is the most righteous judge. So judicially, he was made to be sin for me. Somebody say for me. For me. For me. So let me stop right there. So while you're saying for me, I want you to process that. I want you to digest that. I want you to eat that. I want that to become a part of you that when you mess up, when you fall, when you sin, stop trying to prove yourself not guilty. Stop trying to prove your own innocence. Stop trying to try and and defend your own case. Stop trying to be your own defender. And glory to God, stop being your own prosecutor. Come on. on. Am I the only one who's ever been there? That when I look around at those who oppose me, they don't oppose me half as much as I'm opposing me because I messed up. But when we remember the cross, when we stand under the cross examination of the cross of Christ, we are not our own enemy. Come on. Because we have a friend in Jesus. We have a mighty good friend in Jesus. So it says that he would become the righteousness. That we would become in him the righteousness of God. 
meaning we'd be made acceptable. That's that peace, y'all. That's God making peace with heaven and earth and everything in heaven and earth because of what Jesus did. Now tell me this, if there is nothing, nothing whatsoever, you or I, you and I, or any other man, woman, or child did to make this happen, why do you think it's something you can do to cancel it? Are you so above the mind, the plan, the hand, and the heart of God that you can counsel what he's already done, what he's finished because you messed up, because you fell short, because you sinned? Come on, think about it. Are you going to slap Christ in the face after he hung on the cross and did it all like he's got to do something else? We shall not. And it says, because of his gracious, loving kindness. Colossians 2 and 14 says that he nailed our record of debt to the cross. Somebody said he nailed it. He nailed it. Come on. Every record of debt that we would ever have, he nailed it to the cross. Never to be attached to us again. Never ever to be attached to us again. In the Gospels, they record where Jesus said, anyone who desires to follow me must deny himself and take up his cross. Now, that doesn't mean we walk around carrying wood on our back. That means that whatever, that trial that is in our life, that we carry it with the character of Jesus Christ. We carry it remembering his suffering and remembering his shame and knowing that we do not have to live a life of suffering and a life of shame yeah. because he already did it. Yeah. He yeah. already did it. Glory to God. Oh. Philippians 2 and 8 says that our Jesus, our Lord, was obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross. Paul says in Galatians that the only thing we have to boast about is the cross of Jesus Christ. Is the cross of, cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. And Paul was one that could have boasted. He had reason to boast, but he didn't even boast. No one has the right to boast about anything but Jesus and him crucified. So when we think about what took place at the cross, what was at the cross, what was on the cross, what led up to this cross, we some think that it was murder. Some say, well, if he gave up his life, it was suicide. But no, it was neither. It was sacrifice. It was passion. Passion led to what took place on the cross. Glory to God. So we need to be in a routine of habitually processing evidence and habitually testifying, giving our testimony. Remember, a witness is someone who has critical information, carries critical information, and that witness is going to be protected until that witness can get on that stand and share that critical information so that there can be a just and fair verdict. Glory to God. Well, I tell you what, in the salvation system, glory to God, when that evidence is brought to trial, when you bring the evidence of Jesus Christ, the evidence of the empty tomb, come on somebody, the evidence of the, the, the rock rolled away, the evidence of the hundreds of people who saw him after he rose from the dead, when you bring that evidence, glory to God, no matter how unfair the trial might be, we know that we're going to walk out not guilty. We're going to walk out now guilty because he has already stamped that on our record in heaven. Glory to God. Jesus took this stuff to the cross. And we know that when the enemy tries to ascertain the origin of the evidence, because the thing about it is the accuser can rightfully say, I call him in the act. You know, the Bible says that he goes before God accusing us. 
he goes before God. I think y'all heard me this say this before that I don't care how many times the devil goes to God and tells him the truth on me, <laughs> right? He ain't lying, but tells God the truth on me because I believe in the cross and the work of the cross. Yeah. I don't worry about him because somebody beat him there. Yeah. My advocate beat him to the throne. The devil can't ever show up before my intercessor. The devil can't ever get to the ear of God before Jesus makes intercession for April. Come on. Ain't no way. So I don't care, devil. Go tell him what he already knows. I'm pleading the blood. I'm pleading the blood. I'm not pleading guilty. I'm pleading the blood. I'm not even pleading that guilty. I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. That's how I'm walking out of this thing. I'm pleading the blood of Jesus, glory to God. So you need to know on today that you are found not guilty by reason of salvation. Hallelujah. By reason of salvation, you have been found not guilty. You and you and you and everyone who accepts the redemptive work, redemptive work of Jesus Christ. You have been found not guilty. And it frustrates me sometimes when I think of in the Gospels where it gives the account, like in Matthew 27, and I think Mark 15, when it gives the account of the people at the cross mocking Jesus and saying, if you are the son of God, come down from there, call angels to your rescue. If you are the son of God, if you are the king that you say you are, rescue yourself. You're talking about saving us? Save yourself. And they antagonized him, glory to God. And see what they were doing, they were trying to get our Christ, our Lord, our Savior, to present some evidence that would amaze them. But see, the thing about it is they thought that because he did not, he wasn't God. Because... Yeah, come on, tell us this. Come on. They thought that because he did not come down, he wasn't God. But the very fact that he didn't proves that he was God, proves that he was the son of God, proves that he was the only one that could sacrifice. And what Jesus did on that day, he revamped the whole reputation of the cross. Come on. He took that thing that was despicable, that symbol of torture. Yes, it's still a symbol of torture, but now through that torture, we have victory. Come on, somebody say, I got victory. I got victory. Yeah, through, through that, we have victory. Glory to God. Through that shame, we are now delivered. And that symbol of torture is my symbol of healing. My symbol of salvation. Glory to God. We don't know how many human beings were nailed to those crosses during that time. We have no idea how many, even after Jesus, were nailed to that cross. But there was not one before and there was not one after that could change the destination of our souls other than Jesus, other than our advocate, amen? Glory to God. So what is our application on today? Our application is let us examine yeah. and not just examine, but cross examine yeah. anything that comes in your courtroom, mm -hmm. anything that comes within your life. You need to compare it to the cross. Yeah. You need to do the cross test, cross examine that thing before you share that post, cross examine it. How does it line up with what the, the cross symbolizes and what the cross represents in my life. Come on, we know the cross represents freedom, liberty, peace, love, salvation, redemption, strength. Come on, putting back together again. We were reconciled unto God because of what Jesus did on the cross. So before you hit stand on that text, cross examine it. Before you enter into that conversation of gossip, cross-examine your reason for even being there. Cross-examine that relationship. Cross-examine that opportunity. Cross-examine that, that, that job, that promotion. Cross-examine it. And if it stands up to the cross-examination, then you know this is good for you. Glory to God.
everything that Jesus did on the cross was good for us. And the last scripture I'll reference is the scripture that says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men, that's it. I will draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Well, in studying and in even hearing this preached before, well, not preached, but taught before, we find that the word men, M-E-N, was only added to the King James translation. We learn that the word men, and most of your Bibles will have it italicized, means that it wasn't in the original manuscript. So the original manuscript actually read, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to me. I will draw all to me. All what? All sin, all unrighteousness, all unforgiveness, all hatred, all filthiness, all prejudice. I will draw it all unto me. So what our Lord Jesus did, he drew unto and upon himself all sin, sin from the north and the south, sin from the east and the west. Sin from thousands of years before he was born. Sin from thousands of years after he was born. Sin from people who had died. Sin from people who had never been born. Come on, he drew it all unto him. If I be lifted up, I will draw all unto me. So you see at the cross on Calvary, that was the meaty place. The meaty place for sin. All sin that was in the earth and all sin that was in the future had to be drawn to that one place and had to be placed upon our Jesus. That's how he became sin. He who knew no sin, he was lifted up on the cross that he had created with his words. He was lifted up on the wood that had only come by his voice. He was lifted up, glory to God. There was nothing made that was not made by him. He even made the nails that secured his hands and his feet to the cross, glory to God. But he was lifted up. And when he lifted up, glory to God, he drew every sin that I've ever committed. Every sin that I will ever commit. He drew it unto him. He drew all unto him. He drew cancer unto him on that hill. He drew epilepsy unto him on that hill. He drew AIDS unto him on that hill. He drew COVID unto himself on that hill. He drew everything, every malady, every affliction, every dark thing, every dark, oh my God, he drew it unto him. He drew it all. So what is there in your life that you think he knew? What sin that you can't seem to stop do you think Jesus knew? Is he capable of missing a sin? The Bible says, I'll draw all. Oh, he drew that pain. He drew that pain. So, what do we do today in our application of this word and this, this truth? He drew it all into him. So that in that body, he could take everything that was now upon him, transport it through space and time into the pit of hell, make a divine exchange. Yes, yes. He left Uh what needed to be left, and he took. What needed to be possessed. And he ascended. And he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. Interceding on our behalf. Continually. 
And because he did all that, now, if you're in pain, if you're sick, if you're sin, you can draw back from him. But what we draw from him is what he gained in his getting up. He got up with all power. He got up with all authority. He got up with everything that we need to get up. So we draw it back from him. We know that he is our advocate. We know that he is the one. He is the only one. So I'm here to not convince you, but just tell you a fact and let you know that if you have accepted the redemptive terms and conditions <laughs> of the cross, if you have, not everybody has, but if you have, then you now have the right to plead the blood of Jesus. And know that without a shadow of doubt, you are not guilty. And you know what I've learned? I've learned from watching people in my life, people in my family, even people who are um, famous, that there is a walk. <laughs> There's a stride that an innocent person has that a guilty person just don't have. There's a stature. There's a, a, just a, a presence of character when you know you're not guilty of that thing. Come on. When you know you're not guilty of it. When you can walk, when you can walk into a room and you know that even though I may have done something to these people at one point in time, I'm not guilty right now. Come on. There's a way that we step. So Jesus is trying to get, get you to get your stride back. No more holding our heads down. Hanging our heads in shame. I don't care if you clean the building where the CEOs work. Your head better be higher than the one that's making the three of uh, uh, the six digit figure salary. Come on. If you are in Christ, if you have received this redemptive terms and conditions of the cross. Come on. We have something that the world does not have. We have a cross on our side. Yes. Jesus carried it on his back, but we have a cross on our side. Yes. We have a cross on our side. And I want you to stand at your feet as we close on today. I want you to consider the fact that Jesus did it. If anybody comes to you and asks you, did you do such and such? Mm -mm, Jesus did it. That was Jesus. Jesus, Jesus had motives. And he had opportunity. Well, now. Well, <laughs> his now. motive was love. Yes. And his opportunity came when the father said, let us make a body. Yes, yes, yes. When he was born of a virgin, that presented his opportunity to come on in and make it happen and to finish the work. Father, we thank you. Lord, we glorify you in this house. God, we thank you that we do not take lightly the suffering of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do not take lightly what he endured. But God, we thank you that as Hebrews tells us, that he endured for the joy that was beyond the cross. So God, we thank you that just as Jesus endured the unthinkable, we shall endure every trial that comes into our life. But God, we thank you that we don't have to do it alone. We thank you, God, that we have help. Thank you, Lord, that we have an advocate. 
Thank you, Lord, that we have one plea in our case continually before your throne. We thank you for Jesus. Now, God, I pray over these, your people, that they would begin to process the evidence in their lives. And if there is people, places, things, thoughts, words, deeds, that the evidence is undeniable, that it should not be, help us, God. Help us, God, to turn those things over to you, the righteous judge. Oh, you are the righteous judge. Yes. We know that you won't do us wrong, oh God. Thank you, God. We know, Lord God, that you already sent Jesus to take the punishment. You already released every bit of anger and rage and frustration and punishment upon your son. So help us to be free in coming to you. Lord, you said that if we come to you and confess our sins, that you are just and you are faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Because Jesus drew all unrighteousness unto himself on the cross. God, we love you and we praise you. Father, empower these, your witnesses, to go and tell somebody the truth. Not the truth about who we are, but the truth about who Jesus is and what he did. And God, please, the next time the accuser comes, whether it's a dark spirit or whether it's a family member, whether it's a co-worker, whether it's a spouse or a child, if they come with cross-examination, Lord, help us to plead the blood of Jesus Hallelujah. and know that we are not guilty by reason of salvation. You, God, God, we love you and praise you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Somebody give God a hand clap of praise.